follow along the same theme, don't they? The choir piece and trusting. And, um, that's an old one we haven't used in quite a while. Before we go to uh, scripture, uh, I just want to make sure I re-emphasize the prayer meeting tonight. It's uh, it's not the last Sunday as usual, but I, as I had talked with Jeff earlier, with Memorial Day weekend coming up, uh, five Sundays uh, it will be tonight. So if you're so inclined, I'd urge you to take part. Um, I think we're going to have some special prayers for um, the new church and, and all those kind of things. So uh, just make sure you be a part of that tonight if you can be. And I did want to say, uh, uh, praise God again for what I was hearing, what I was learning, and, and, and the plant sale, the effort that was given to it, just recapping. Uh, it's special to me as a, as a pastor to see all that and, and know that you made it uh, happen all in the name of the Lord. And we are going to continue those things, and it is what really counts, and to be able to work together, to be able to smile together, um, and just to be able to be a part of something. He blesses it when the Spirit is right. And I believe the Spirit is right in that case. So, uh, praise God. Revelation 20 is where we're going to go today on our message. You might smile a little bit this morning. Um, if, if you hear my... My voice is slightly a little different. When I was eating my breakfast this morning, a chunk of tooth, I, I mean, your, your mouth thinks that it's like a, like a piece that's big, but, but it isn't. It's just the tongue is a very poor uh, uh, teacher indicator of what's going on. But one of my front teeth had an old filling that was in that had been chipped years ago, and it popped out. So if you hear a little woodchuck whistle once in a while, <laughs> something's not just right. Um, uh, just that's what it really is. It's not what uh, I'm trying to be. Uh, not trying to fool with you or anything like that. So, Revelation 20. Now it's not maybe the usual place where we might go on on any given Sunday, but uh, there's a lot to these things. There's a lot of study in Revelation. But I just want you to to take a look at your title uh, that was given. Uh, two words, just you. Okay, and what you might think that's going to be, just you. Revelation 20, uh, and we'll, we'll have to break this down a little bit later, but then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil, and Satan bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nation no more until a thousand years were finished. After these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and John is saying this, verse 4, And they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished, and this is the first resurrection. I'm just going to halt there a little bit, and... Uh, there are a lot of things in Revelation. There, there, there are timelines, which we certainly wouldn't go into today. But just to get the idea, um, Satan gets thrown into a pit by the Almighty God for a thousand years. And you ask me, oh, why is that? No theologian knows that. No scholar, Bible scholar knows that. It's just what's written, written it's what's printed. And after the thousand years, he is, uh, the millennium, they call it, he will be released. And then he'll be immediately snuffed out. And um, this is what... Uh, what we're going to pick up on here as we go here. And six, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. I want you to imagine um, the world around you right now. With everything perfect, with Jesus sitting on the throne, no trouble, no sin. Everything is just perfect. All things have been renewed. All the old things that we experience and know that fail, that aren't right, from the, the diseases that kill our trees to whatever else comes along, um, it's gone. 
Okay? Satan is gone. For now. And he will go out to receive the, when he's released, then, and he will go out to deceive the nations which are at the four corners of the earth, Gog, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to a battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. Now, <laughs> I, don't, I don't spend too much time with the ocean, but uh, what I have, and I've looked at, you know, there's a lot of grains of sand. That's all I know. So there's going to be a lot of people at this battle at the, at the very end. Nine, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the blood of the city. <clears throat> and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Ten, the devil who had deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. <clears throat> they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's a long time. Verse 11, and I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And the great judge sits on his throne. Such an intense thing that heaven and earth flee away from. And there was found no place for them. It's a unique place that people have speculated through the years, but when the judgment seat takes place and the people stand before it, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. You've heard me talk about the book of life before. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, death and hell. Delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to its works. Then death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Now I want you to consider that a little bit. There's so many things in here, but... Just think of it for a minute. We talk about it. If you die and you don't have Christ, you go to hell. Or Satan is. Or you get, you get all the demons are. But in this situation here, we're, we're upping it. We're upscaling it big time. Death and hell are cast into this lake of fire. Okay? A second death. And anyone, uh, I can make a sermon out of this verse right here, but and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay? Pretty straightforward stuff. And, and uh, so there's that woodchuck whistle again. <laughs> I know I get you to smile. I'm not going to smile too much because it. So we bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do praise you for your precious word that you have given to us as you print it and have kept it all these years so that we can look at it even in our time. We do praise your holy name, and we pray that your word would go out and bless each and every one who receives it today. And as you've said, it won't return void. We do praise you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Just a, just a brief uh, pause here, which, uh, you know, not to interrupt the flow of the message at all, but this year marks the 200th anniversary of the old church down in Burlington. 1822 to 2022. And I have an idea for some of you for something that we can do, but um, we need to up it, and we'll talk about that sometime. <coughs> but no matter what happened in that time and the troubles they've had since, it's still the same God. He still reigns, and he's still on his throne. Yesterday, instead of being at the plant sale, I was planting myself, as they say, with a corn plant. And I want you to think about it for a minute. <clears throat> the guy that plants the corn, and I took over from my dad, and my dad took over from grandpa, and uh, I don't know how I got the job. I suggested when Papa didn't want to plant anymore, we got a different planter. He said, I don't know. And I said, well, Zach, here you go. And he said, no, no. no. I got the corn planting job. He has to drill the Draining in the small <coughs> seeds of grass and everything. So, whatever happens when you're on that planter, okay? The first year we had a planter in between the one we have now, now we have a John Deere. But it was all new to us. <coughs> and uh, it had this monitor thing, you know? And <laughs> we mounted it on the tractor, the cocoon thing. That's, it goes back into the, the 80s, you know? It just wires and flashing lights, you know? That's, that's all it was and a little probe down in each uh, drop uh, tube. <laughs> the 
the guy told me, he says, these things are very, very unreliable there. He says, but you can look at it and, and use your own judgment. You know, Dad was still playing at that time. And Zach was up helping him. And uh, I was milking the cows at that time. And uh, one light kept flashing. And uh, they came down to see me. And while I was in the barn, I said, well, you remember what the guy said. Uh, I wouldn't trust it. So they kept planting. And uh, of course, the old way is you always get off in the uh, maybe halfway when the field's half done, or maybe when the field is all done. Definitely when the field is all done before you start the day. You, you, some of the old planters you can spin the wheel, or you can, uh, on the newer one I've got a wrench that I turn part of the shaft and, and see if they're dropping on, on the open ground to make sure you're still planting. Well, later on after the corn came up and you can see the rows good. Um, you've heard me tell this story before, I think. Uh, instead of a four-row planter, it was three and one missing. So we realized right away what had happened, and, and, and they had uh, unplugged it apparently at some point. It was only a couple of fields, fortunately. The neighbor, uh, we, everybody has a nosy neighbor or two, and the one he, he came down, he says, what is that? Who did that? I said, well, it's not me. I didn't plant the corn. <laughs> I didn't tell him I gave the advice or the, or the, the urge to go on, but uh, he says, I said, yeah, every, every three rows. I said, that's the new three in one planter. Well, what's that? Plants three and skips one. Why would it do that? Then he finally caught on. He said, why? <laughs> but whatever you do when you're planting corn, now, as I thought about it yesterday, there's all kinds of things that, that go into that. Very expensive granulated fer fertilizer for us. How many pounds per acre do you put on, whether it's 200, 100, 250, 300, whatever you think it, it needs. If you don't put it on, you're probably going to see the difference as the corn uh, makes its way up. Do I put on 20,000 kernels per acre or do I put on 30,000 or 28,000? A lot of that depends on the closeness of the rows or, or, or do I uh, have the wrong set up and there's like a stalk here, a stalk here, a stalk here, or maybe it's so thick it's like like these fingers right here, you know. Thicker hair on a dog, as my grandpa would say. So all these things, when it comes down to it, uh, the point I'm trying to get is these two words in your title. Just you. If you planted the corn and the neighbors talk about it, it's, it's, it's you. If you planted the corn. Nobody else can be blamed. You can try, but you're the one that had to wash to make sure it was planted right. On, on these planters, there's even the older, like there's chains everywhere, and you've got to kind of watch them and make sure they're all turning. That's why I sit on a little old dusty Ford tractor. No cab, just a, and, uh, and I was sharing it with Wade in the office before, as we do sometimes. We have a canopy on the old thing, all right? And he smiled when I told him. And uh, after I bought the place where we live now, 1982, down on the edge of the wood, woods was an old Edsel car, the motor and transmission and all gone. You've heard of Ford Edsels in the late 50s. They, were, they didn't pan out. They weren't any good. But everything was there, the seats, uh, the doors, uh, the hood was there. And I told my dad, I said, boy, that'd be nice to have a canopy on that tractor. How about we rob the hood off the old Edsel? And he looked at me and, jeepers, go ahead. So we, we took it off and we fastened it on. It had the, had the, the safety roll bar on it which is, you know, um, is safe. So we bolted that and put on and why we got all kinds of conversation, all kinds of talk. One guy stopped by and he says, you know, you look just like Barney Rubble and when he's getting out there. And, and if you look at it, it's got a few loose ends on the front now that flutter because of the trees and the limbs when you go around. Now Zach hits it when he gets on the tractor, so he has to be careful. Another guy said, well, that just looks like a Batmobile. But that's the tractor I use, open station, out in the, out, the wind was blowing yesterday, and especially when the wind was behind you, the corn planter goes through the dry ground. I mean, I had to literally wash my eyelids out last night and spit some stuff, and you know, I ate lots of dust. But my grandpa used to say, I need a peck of dirt before you die, so uh, I don't know what that meant, but he also said, plant your corn into the dust, and it will bring your bins to bust. Hopefully. 
Let's move on to another farming thing. I have some time here. Spraying your ground. You've seen ground that's all brown, that was green a few weeks ahead. Well, they've sprayed it with some uh, herbicide to kill weeds. Well, I know of an individual once, and they were picking on him awful at one of the crop schools we go to every year. He was spraying and fell asleep. And the tractor went this way and that way and went around and around. Oh, they gave him an awful time. Nice alfalfa, too. It was all just... <laughs> It was, it, was, it was interesting. But again, when you spray, and you know, if you go to any of the schools, you learn right away, you're responsible for what's going into that, where it's dumped, you know, any issues that would arise from a leak where it should have been, the whole thing. Or why do you have knee-high weeds? Didn't you spray that? Well, I did, you know, but it just didn't pan out this year. It's on you, it's just you. And you're already forming in your minds other things that you have done that's just you when the test comes out, okay? I had a plan earlier, but then I said, no, it's not worth wasting the paper, but I was gonna do like the school teacher used to do. I don't know if they do that anymore or not, but they would pass out pieces of paper with a test on it, each and every one of you, and they would always say, no, don't look on your neighbor's paper. It's just you. We all know that didn't always happen, but just to make a point here today, it's just you. One last little thing here, okay, when it comes to the, the farming part, okay? I think most everybody here has handled a square bale of hay at some time or another. Probably some more than they want to remember. <laughs> it's always at the hottest time of the year, and I, I've thrown plenty of them, you know, before we went to round bales and baleage, you know, 20,000 a year and more at our peak, hot up in that old place. Grandpa always used to say, go up there and get up a good sweat. Good for you, and get the poison out of you that you accumulated last winter, he'd say. So uh, all those things that, uh, I don't know, but they're, they're memories. But back to that square baler, okay? And uh, I taught Zach this real quick when he was around me the same way. The last thing you want to do when you run out of twine and, and it goes to the next roll of twine is to have the knot that you connected them with be a bad knot that slips out. And with the square baler, the needles and the thing that it threads it through goes out of it. And you gotta crawl underneath and fish the string up through the needles. Round baler isn't much better. Fool around with the twine arms and all the, and the twine's becoming extinct with round balers anyway, but we still have an old baler that still uses twine. But when you put those rolls in and, and everybody that works with any kind of a baler at all, square, round, and you're still using twine, you have either a four or a six or whatever, and when the one that's used up while you're baling goes to the next one and keeps working its way through. But you have to have a square knot. If you ever went to FFA, uh, when I was in there, the, one, of the, one of the sessions we had was learning how to tie knots. Half hitches and bowlins and square knots, and there's a whole bunch. He had a huge wall with all these knots all made, and we had to learn them. But a square knot was one of the easy, basic things he had to learn, okay? And my dad, I remember him showing me went out on a hot day, putting twine, and he says, look at this. Then he'd pull it out, and he said, now that's a granny. I said, how do you get a granny from a knot that didn't hold? I don't know, he says, it's just a granny. That's what my dad told me, so. So I showed Zach how to do it, and it just depends on how you fold those two strings. When you pull them together, if you get a square knot, you can't pull it apart. But if you don't, you have a granny, you're going to pay for it. When you're, when you're bailing, all of a sudden, especially that old round baler, twine goes, <laughs> it's gone. Oh, man. It's all on you. You made the knot. Nobody else. I made the knot. I made the donuts. I don't know why I thought of that, but it's that old commercial for Dunkin' Donuts. Zach and I will do that once in a while about milking and chores. It's time to milk. Oh, I just I just milked. Yeah, it's time to milk, you know. And the little guy with a little goatee used to say, time to make the donuts. Well, I just made them. It's time to make them again. But it's all on you. Back to the, the biblical aspect of this, okay? As I said, in, in the study of Revelation, there's, there's plenty. And you sure, sure can't cover anything in depth in a morning service. <clears throat> but what we do is we bring out 
certain points and certain parts. And where we're at there in, in the, the very end of Revelation is those who know Christ have already been taken up. Already with him, okay? This part that we read today is about the judgment seat of Christ. After that's done, is the great white throne judgment, okay? I'm going to pause here a little bit. And we've all heard of standing before our maker. He is the judge, okay? We've all heard of that. And I want you to know, because it's just, today it just seems like in the press, wherever it is, whatever happens, it was the other guy's fault. Or I'm going to get out of this with this one, this one, this one is going to help me. We're going to move some stuff around. When you stand before the almighty God, okay, he knows you by name. It's just you. Okay? If you ever watch any of those courtroom shows, uh, I go all the way back. I remember Perry Mason when I was a kid. Everybody younger said, what's that? Well, just check around some of those old channels. You'll find them. But all the way up to, you know, the stuff that they have today, complex stuff, they're very interesting at times. But you always have a judge. You always have a jury. And you have lawyers on both sides. And if things don't go your way, uh, you can say, well, I'm going to appeal. We're going to try this again. When you stand before the almighty God, he is the perfect judge. There's no need of a jury. The days of a lawyer are gone. And it's just you and him face to face. Okay? Now that can be good. If you already know the Lord and your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life, which is spoken of here. He opens the book. The angel does, it says. And goes down the ledger and sees if your name is there. Have you ever been somewhere waiting in line or waiting for something and hoping your name was on the list of reservations or whatever and somebody said, well, I don't see your name here anywhere. Uh, you can't get on this train or you can't go on this flight or you can't go into the hotel, whatever. Somebody a while back was telling me about whole bunches of people that didn't get their reservations because somebody messed it up. And they were stirring them all over the city. You'll stand before the Almighty God, whether, whether it's you know him and he sees you and he calls you home and says, welcome home, or whether you don't know him and you reject him and you stand before him when he's on the great white throne judgment. As I said in earlier messages, God never intended that any of his children ever go to hell or worse yet the lake of fire. Never intended it. But when we sinned in the Garden of Eden, it chased us along and still does today. If you know him as your personal savior, you're okay. But if you don't, it's just as easy as black and white. It truly is. Square knot or a granny, right? And it's all up to you. Three rows or four. It's all up to you. Just you. And you can't look around and at, at judgment day and God's on his throne and you're standing there and saying, well, it was, it was, it's just you and him. He's the perfect judge. He knows everything. There's no gray areas. There's no way you can pull something out of the hat. No getting a lawyer to do some angles or some plea bargains or anything like that. It's just you and the Almighty, the great God of heaven. So I want you to think about that just a little bit. Because many times, and I think our society, the way it is today, promotes that. I can do this or I can do that. I can fudge my way through most anywhere. Get the right connections, pay the right cash, see the right people. In this case, you have to recognize that we are all sinners. All of us. 
God knows you by name. He knows the very hairs on your head. And, and uh, older guys like me, when they're in the pulpit, will sometimes make the joke he didn't have to work as hard as he used to. He knows you by name. And he calls you to be with him. Back to the old picture. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. There's no handle on the outside, but you, if you let him in, he'll come in. He calls continuously to all his children, whoever they are. Reject him. There awaits a lake of fire. Accept him. There awaits a heavenly home that you can fellowship with your family members who have gone on before, people who will be there that you can't even imagine, all the biblical characters in a heavenly place that we can't, eye has not seen, nor ear heard that which God has prepared for those loving. Now, I like the outside. I like the beauty of nature and all that God has created. And it's beautiful stuff. But God says, that's, that's nothing. He says, this is, this is tainted. This is marred by sin. I can't imagine. Jesus said, I go to prepare a mansion for you. Just for you. I can see it if he said, well, I prepare a ma mansion for 500 of you or something. You can't only imagine what that would be. For you, I prepare a mansion. All of us immediately, in our mind, have an idea of what a mansion would be that we would like. I've seen some. But Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, a mansion for you. So I'm just going to say, pure and simple as it is, that's all it is. A good square and honor and granny, not a lippy. We were moving heifers. What day was it, Zach? I don't know. It doesn't matter. And uh, Zach does the leading in time. And for some reason, and I learned from my granddad, you know, with the old cattle truck. You're responsible for the animal when you tie. If somebody gets hurt or backed up over or something goes on, you're responsible. Ooh. Well, we went to get another one, and all of a sudden, out in the silo room, bang, 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 crash, bang, crash, bang, bang, bang. I said, Zach. And I ran around there, and the heifer had got untied out of the, she was running around in the silo room with a rope on. So he went back, and we got her, and it takes a pretty rugged one to stall Zach out. Most of them go on the truck whether they want to or not. But you're responsible for that knot. You're responsible for that animal. Same if you go to the Troy Fair and take your 4-H calf there. You're responsible for that animal. I remember working with 4-Hers and teaching them stuff. I also remember when one of the kids' pigs got, got loose. Remember when the state police used to have a a trailer in center court by the water trough. And a bunch of pigs went down through there and they started running up under there and the kids tried to get them stopped and then the trooper came out and he looked around. Somebody said, there's pigs under your trailer. <laughs> I never forget that. But they're responsible for them. They had to catch them. They aren't easy to catch, I'm telling you. They are not easy to catch. But when it comes to the Almighty, it's just you. You can't look at the neighbor and say, well, this neighbor did this to me, or this person said this to me, or this person. It's just you. Pure and simple, just you. I know places where uh, if you work in a restaurant or a pizzeria or whatever, if that goes in the box and it goes out, you've got your name on that. Just you. Do whatever you need to do to get yourself right with God and your neighbors and your friends. And it's not all that, it, you don't have to turn yourself into a, a Bible-thumping, whatever, maniac. Just consider what it is that you need to do to have yourself an eternal home and to leave this life. Do whatever you need to do to open the channel. One last quick thing, our old red truck, the radio has been doing funny things for a long time. So today while I was waiting for the heifers at the ranch to come up to the corral, I had an old screwdriver. So I popped the cover off on the radio. And radios are different today. I mean, this is an old three, but it isn't like the old ones that I used to take the knob off and screw and the whole thing would come out and be two wires to unplug. It's just a 
circuit board on, on the front of a, a metal frame. So I pulled it off and I rubbed everything down and just kind of waiting and it would come and it would go and it got to the point where it was gone more than it was coming. And, and uh, so I put her back in there lined up and just four pegs and, and there's a little uh, uh, thing with the wires plug and I popped her in there and I took the screwdriver and boom, boom, boom across the bottom. And you know what? The radio lit up and it went. And it's still working the last I knew. Do whatever you need to renew your connection with your Almighty Father. Shall we bow our heads for a little prayer? Heavenly Father, we do praise you for being able to be here in your house. We know that you speak, that you are alive, and you know each and every one of us. We pray that you would help us to know who you are and what you are. All we simply need to do is recognize that you are our Savior and ask you into our heart and ask to have your name, my name, written in that Lamb's book of life. We do pray that you would bless your word as it goes out this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And uh, back to the hymnals again. 552. And I think you were reminded.